to another Sunday Live. Um, I'm just going to get the chat set up on my laptop next to me, so bear with me for a little bit just to get this all set up. I'll turn the sound off. Okay. There's always a little bit of, you know, organising when you start a live. Um, and going live on the internet is, is not something that comes naturally to me. <laughs> um, so if anyone is here, please let me know if you can hear me. I'm trying it out with the microphone, so uh, fingers crossed, yeah, it works okay. But let me know if you can't hear me or anything. See, there's a few people on here. Um, but hello to anyone else who is watching this back again um, on a playback. I really like doing these lives because it's kind of a way to kind of do a sort of podcast without doing a podcast. Um, I feel like YouTube is quite easy to kind of have on in the background some of the time um, and just listen to, you know, a stream or something like that or whatever you want to really listen about on YouTube. YouTube is a never ending um, magical world. <laughs> Um, but today we are going to be going into the gardening world and um, talking a little bit about how to garden with nature and also for nature as well. So the way this is going to work is I love anyone who pops on this live chat to please let us all know where you're from. Um, and also make sure you obviously grab your tea or coffee. I have with me a peppermint tea today. Um, trying to, you know, just wind down from the weekend and have a nice calming Sunday afternoon. Um, but if you're anywhere else in the world, yeah, I'd love to know where you're from, um, what's the weather like. I feel like that's kind of a, a question that a lot of gardeners seem to ask and uh, want to know the answer to. <laughs> um, so here it's, it's, you know, it's hot. It's southeast Queensland. We're in a subtropical area. And today, or pretty much the whole past week, it has been quite warm here. And I was really, really hoping that we would pretty much be done with summer <laughs> um, and that the autumn temperatures would start. But no, we're still going. So, um, yeah, it's been quite warm. Definitely, you know, over 30s. We had a high 30 day the other day. Um, yeah. Oh, hi, Barry. And hi, Josh. It's great to see you both. Barry just started following the first time. It's very clear just north of Brisbane. Awesome. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, it's great to have some people from around Southeast Queensland kind of, you know, talking about, you know, what to plant and what to grow. And it's really, really relatable, which is awesome. So hopefully we can have a really good conversation about what we're all planting at the moment. Um, and yeah, tying in a little bit of nature into our gardening, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. Hi, Tilly. Great to see you. You're in sunny South Australia. Awesome. I have yet to explore a lot of southern, a lot of South Australia. I've been to Adelaide once, but um, it's definitely on my to-do list and yeah, on my bucket list to go down there. There's some beautiful different walks down there that are, are on my list. Um, <laughs> awesome. So uh, before I kind of start a lot of my lives and something that I, I've liked to do um, that I, I do in my train of work and I also like to do when I'm starting a presentation. Um, is to just acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on. So I would like to acknowledge the Yuggera people of um, which their land I'm on today around in the Brisbane region. So I'd like to acknowledge um, elders past, present and emerging um, and pay respects to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders that join in on uh, this live or are watching it back um, or any Indigenous people from around the world um, and really acknowledge that their connections to land and sea and spirits is still um, very relevant and um, something that we can all learn from. So um, also just kind of going to start today by just kind of um, I've got a list here because I'm a little bit more prepared this time. <laughs> um, and I was going to talk about what I've been doing in the gardening, about in the garden lately. Um, so what I've been planting, things I've been enjoying. Um, and I think last time I started out by talking about the different books that I've been enjoying. Um, reading is something that I love to do and I really don't get enough time to do it. Um, so I've only really managed to kind of work on one book this month, um, but it's pretty relevant, I, I find, to the chat that we're going to have today. 
um, and that is to speak for the trees. I never know how to pronounce her name, but I think it's Diana Beresford Kroger. Um, and she is like myself, an environmental scientist. Um, and she does a lot of work. She's from Ireland and she does a lot of work in uh, Canada and Northern America on conservation and preserving a lot of the forests up there. And some of her interpretations of um, how she connects to nature is really, really interesting in this book that I found. Um, it, you know, I probably rate it a three and a half out of five, mainly because she does talk a lot about her um, kind of university experience and um, a, a lot about her, her life, which although is super interesting, um, I'm kind of more in it for the nature side of things. Um, but if you are interested in a, in a really great book, I'd really recommend to speak for the trees. Um, the other little thing on the book is my life's journey from ancient Celtic wisdom to a healing vision of the forest. And that is really kind of what she takes you along throughout the book is her uh, connection to her Celtic heritage, which I find absolutely, you know, super fascinating. Um, yeah, about Celtic mythology and um, connecting and their connections to nature and how that's kind of brought through, um, you know, into modern day as well. So yeah, that's probably the, the one thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of things that I've been liking. Um, but throughout this chat and throughout the live, uh, if you have any kind of questions that you want me to talk about, any topics that you'd like me to talk about, um, just let me know in the chat. I've got my laptop down here, so I will be looking down a little bit um, and it's a little bit delayed, but that's okay. We'll, we'll sort it out. Um, and I've kind of got a little bit of things that I wanted to talk about. Um, but again, it's a really informal chat to really just catch up and, um, yeah, talk about what we've all been up to. So if you, um, want to say hello and tell me what you've been doing in the garden, I would love to read about that and talk about it in the chat while we kind of have a little bit of a, a debrief at the start of the live. Um, hi Nola, the hardy gardener just came in from the garden. Awesome. What were you up to in the garden? What kind of jobs were you doing today? Were you planting or watering the garden? We've had a little bit of rain around here, so I haven't had to water today. Um, but I think I'll probably have to start doing that again tomorrow. Um, things that I've been doing in the garden this weekend, um, not that I've had too much time, um, cause we had a birthday party last night. So, um, yesterday was kind of, um, yeah, getting, getting all that sorted and ready. Um, and today has been quite chill. Um, but I have planted a lot of flowers. Um, I'm starting to get my autumn and winter flowers going. So some of the things that I was planting was a lot of, um, salvias. I have fallen in love with blue salvias. They are just so beautiful. And um, I've been putting them in a herb garden that I'm creating um, that I'll talk about a little bit more in the live as well. Um, but alongside that, um, alyssums, I've been planting a, a bunch of alyssums um, in the hope that in autumn and winter, I can just have little clumps of alyssums here, there and everywhere uh, that I can um, propagate and also hopefully that they'll sell seed and kind of continue in that area. Um, so those are the two kind of flowers that I've been focusing on. Um, I've also been planting some oregano, um, some plant, trying to get all of the herbs in the ground, all the rosemary and basil. Um, I am finding that uh, this time of the year, the bug pressure is really crazy, I think, because uh, we're kind of getting towards the end of summer um, and I feel like the bugs are on like their last leg and trying to, to get all their mating done and get everything done before uh, the cool weather starts. So yeah, the bug pressure in the garden has been quite insane, um, but that's okay. We've been sorting that out. Josh says he's in the middle of sorting out popcorn seeds that you've harvested. Awesome. What variety were you growing for the popcorn? I've only ever grown, um, corn for sweet corn, so to eat it fresh. But, um, I think when I build up the soil a little bit more in the area, um, I'd, I'd really like to start growing some cool popcorn and the, um, the different gem corns, getting all of those different colors as well. Um, Hardy gardening, you've been watering and weeding. Yep, weeding is something that I have also been doing. <laughs> I've actually kind of dedicated a compost bin now for a lot of the weeds that I've been pulling up. 
Um, I've also just been kind of cutting a lot of the, the weeds at the base and then putting all of the green material into one of the compost bins and I'm just going to let that rot down quite, for quite a long time. Um, and there will probably be some weed seeds in there, but at least I know that that's kind of where they will be in that compost bin rather than the other ones that I put my food scraps into. You've also been watching the live streams of the Virtual Sydney Edible Garden Trail. I have been meaning to watch some of those as well. It looks amazing um, seeing other people's gardens. I'm definitely a nosy person and like to have a look at what people are doing. Hello, Homestead Aquarius. Nice to see you. How are you going? How is it where you are in the world at the moment? Awesome. I'm just just looking down every now and again at the chat. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll sort that out. Um, what else was I gonna talk about? I have my list here. Um, oh, another thing that I found really interesting that I watched uh, throughout this week, I can't remember what day, um, but uh, in our last live stream, we were talking about mining and, and that is my job as well to uh, work as an environmental scientist um, alongside some mine sites. Um, and one thing that I did watch, if you're interested in national parks in Australia, I watched um, the latest Four Corners episode. I think it was called Kakadu in Crisis. If you do have the time or if you have watched it, let me know. But if you do have the time, I would really recommend watching it if you're interested in um, what the state of national parks are in Australia. It's a really interesting watch. And for those of you who don't know, Kakadu is one of the biggest national parks in Australia, um, up in the Northern Territory. And it has some of the most beautiful and stunning biodiversity and animals, and lots of crocodiles and plants uh, in the world, really. It's, it's, it's really World Heritage listed. And um, yeah, if you ever get the chance, I'd recommend going up there. But unfortunately there is a lot going wrong with the management of the park right now. Uh, there's a uranium mine kind of around that area that they're looking at how to close it. And it's just, it provides a really great perspective um, on the background of national parks management um, in Australia. And I, I, yeah, definitely recommend watching it if, if you can. So it's called Kakadu in Crisis. Um, cool, so Homestead Aquarius, it is a beautiful evening here. Awesome. So whereabouts are you located? I can't quite remember. Um, yeah, Kakadu is really, really beautiful. Yeah, um, it's. I went there when I was a kid and um, I can still remember it. I still remember once my dad was uh, kind of playing around a little bit and uh, we went down to, we were camping and we went down to this um, area which was filled, it was a big wetland filled with water lilies and you couldn't really quite see underneath the water. My dad was joking that, um, you know, that there might be a few crocodiles in here. Let, let's see how, how it is. He threw a few rocks into the water and no joke, I have never seen that much thrashing and movement in water in my life. <laughs> uh, there must have been about like, oh, I don't know, maybe like eight or so crocodiles in the water. Um, they just went absolutely insane after one move, then all of them else, all of them moved um, and it was just, yeah, crazy, <laughs> um, but amazing to see, so. Awesome, hello, getting started on homesteading, how are you? You're in Alabama in USA, awesome. It's great to see some US fellows here on the live as well. Um, uh, so something else I was gonna talk about, I've got a little bit of a, bit more of a debrief. Um, so if you're in the area of um, Southeast Queensland or really anywhere um, that is kind of coming out of uh, the warmer weather, um, as I was saying that there is a lot of bug pressure right now and something that I also have been doing is um, giving some of the plants a spray. So I try and use more kind of organic or um, just not the really heavy fertilizer, uh, the really heavy uh, pesticides on some of the plants. So I've been using some neem oil for some spray and some soapy water as well um, because the aphids have been going insane on a lot of my plants, including um, the okras. I, I'm starting to get some okra to grow and hopefully um, it'll get to the stage when I can harvest it. Um, but I'm just finding a lot of the leaves are just curling up because they're full of aphids and the ants are farming them. And yeah, it's, 
it's not a great time. So <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely if you can get on top of the bugs, unlike me, before they go insane and crazy. <laughs> um, so if anyone is on here and has questions, I'm more than happy to answer them throughout this live, like I was saying before. Um, I am just going to rehydrate with my peppermint tea. So I thought I would, um, I've got a few notes here on gardening with and for nature that I wanted to talk about today. And kind of have this as a little bit more of a podcast style and um, the reason why and the reason kind of that sparked my inspiration for this was chatting with Marty from Marty's Garden. Um, he has lately been doing a few different kind of chats that are recorded but it's kind of like a live recording really um, of him and chatting to some other people. So Josh was on the other weekend and their conversation was super, super interesting um, kind of talking about um, what's happening with Josh's garden and uh, the chop and drop method as well. Um, so if you get the chance to have a look at Marty's garden, he's got some really great resources um, and I'm super excited to hear some more of his conversations. But uh, we were having the kind of conversation about uh, permaculture and organic gardening and he threw some really awesome uh, questions that I hadn't really thought of <laughs> too much about. Um, but it's something that I want to talk about on my channel and my channel is called the nature patch for a reason, uh, primarily because I have a environmental science background and I want to start to bring a little bit more knowledge into my videos of how we can, um, garden with nature. And what I mean by that is not necessarily creating just a, um, a, like a native ecosystem that doesn't have any food in it um, that you know you would otherwise grow that isn't native but more meaning kind of how can we take a little bit of how nature works and the principles in nature and kind of how different native ecosystems thrive and bring that into the garden to recreate our own little ecosystem in our backyards and this could even just be on a balcony it doesn't have to be in a really large property like this one it can even be in a few different pot plants um, on how we can basically make gardening easier because it can be really hard and a really daunting thing when you first start out gardening um, and uh, there's a lot of trial and error and um, I have gone through a lot of error <laughs> in uh, my gardening time which um, you know hasn't actually been that long like I've been gardening for probably with you know since I, I was a kid really but not seriously until the past five years or so um, but have kind of picked up quite a bit of knowledge or been forced to really pick up a lot of knowledge with my uh, university. So I'm um, trying to bring some of that information to the garden. So before I get into that, I will have a read of um, what Barry said. So when planting seeds, do you prefer to put them into seed trays or directly into the, ground, into the garden? All of our gardens are raised beds under shade, cloth, polypipe tunnels. So that's a really good question and um, for that kind of for me personally I like to do both and sometimes I will do um, sometimes I'll just risk it and um, knowing that on the packet usually it'll say kind of either raise seedlings or sow them direct and as a rule of thumb a lot of larger seeds I will just sow direct so these are things like zucchinis, um, beans, peas, um, kind of larger de like dahlia seeds, zinnia seeds. For some of the finer seeds uh, like alyssums, um, what else? Things that I really want to keep an eye on like tomatoes, I will definitely sow um, them. Mainly because then with tomatoes what I like to do is pot them on and create a stronger plant. Um, but if the plant is less susceptible to to both bug damage and uh, wind damage, then um, I would probably just plant it in the ground. But for things that uh, are a little bit more risky, say like tomatoes or capsicums or something like that, I do like to raise them in pots. That being said, some things like carrots, I will always sow direct. Um, I've always had better success with that. Um, and there are certain parts in the garden where I care less 
and that's where I'll also sow direct. So in the in-ground garden that you would have seen in some of my videos, um, I have been sowing a lot in di uh, as direct um, seeds into that area, but in some of my raised beds where I have a limited space, then usually I'll plant from the different pots that I have. So if you have a smaller space, I'd probably recommend um, you can more easily plan the garden by raising your seedlings, um, but it always yeah, depends on what you want to be growing as well. Um, so starting out the conversation about gardening with nature. Um, so inherently, we are connected to nature. Whether um, you kind of know it or not, we, we definitely are, we are kind of living beings and living alongside um, a lot of other natural things in this world. So uh, we're fund fundamentally connected and we can fundamentally benefit from nature if we allow it to benefit us. And the things that we kind of depend on include things obviously like oxygen, uh, water, food, all of the different nutrients that are in the earth, we end up eventually somehow consuming into our bodies, same as water. Um, eventually it will leave our bodies and probably come back <laughs> eventually. Um, so yeah, it's, it's how we've come to be um, and we're connected to it. But there are different things that we can do to allow uh, nature to benefit us if we work alongside it. Um, so, gotta think about how to yeah talk about this but there's a concept called uh, ecosystem services which is something that I work with a lot uh, with my work and it basically it's you know it can be a complicated concept if you you know search on Google and search a lot of different articles um, but it basically means the benefits that we receive from nature these can both be things that are physical so I you know I have this book right here um, this was once a tree and the tree grew and it is um, benefiting me that, you know, the natural principles that allowed that tree to grow was then turned into paper. And that's kind of a raw material that physically benefits me now, both, um, you know, more so on a mental level, like I get enjoyment from reading the book. Um, but there's other things like, you know, growing your own food in, in our gardens. We benefit from eating the food from the land. Um, we also can benefit from nature by going out and going camping, by um, going fishing, um, any, even just, you know, looking outside right now. I'm kind of in my bedroom and looking out at the trees um, and all of the different rocks around and it's making me feel a lot calmer. Um, so, you know, they can either be more like cultural side of things or, or kind of provisioning and physically, you know, you can benefit from nature. Um, so that kind of, if we think about it like that, we can break it down a little bit more and apply that into the garden as well. So when you go down into the garden, you can consider it more as an ecosystem rather than, um, I don't know, like a grocery store or something like that, where you're just kind of taking and taking. So. I like to think of the garden as an ecosystem and that needs things like air, uh, water, food, sunlight, um, and also movement. So um, things to be able to move through the environment and that includes both the air um, and movement for different animals to move through, which um, something that we'll talk about is pollinators. Um, again, uh, any questions that you may have throughout this, just throw them at me because otherwise I'll just keep talking and talking. <laughs> Mm. So I'll run through some of the things that we can do and some of it's more some of the things I, I personally do. But if you do have any um, uh, like yeah, ideas or um, things that you might want to um, yeah, include in this conversation, just let me know. Um, so the first thing that we can do, and I'm going straight into the specifics of here about something that you can personally do to kind of uh, recreate what might be going on in nature that we might not think about. And one of these things is um, including different fragrant plants in our garden. So uh, well, I'm sure when you walk around in, um, like in a forest setting or in a bushland landscape, you'll start to smell things. And some of the time when you walk around 
um, different gardens, sorry, I'm trying not to touch my microphone. Um, when you walk around different gardens, um, you start to not smell certain things. And uh, fragrant plants is something that a lot of gardens kind of um, miss out. And uh, it's not something that everyone starts to think about. But there are so many different benefits that having a plant that smells um, in your garden. And that is firstly because um, that kind of creates, it's, it's one of the things that different pollinators and bugs need for habitat. So it's going to attract different bugs and pollinators into your garden um, and also do things for you as well. So coming back to the whole um, provisioning and cultural kind of services, you're both benefiting from maybe having something that smells really beautiful in the garden while the bugs are also benefiting um, from, you know, having it as a food source or, or something like that. No worries. Thank you so much for getting started on homesteading um, for coming. It's one in the morning there. No worries. You have a good sleep and um, yeah, we'll see you next time. <laughs> um, so there's different research that shows um, that different fragrant plants have really, really, um, they kind of do certain things to our bodies and our brains. Um, and peppermint is one of those examples and I'll run through a few other different species that we can include in our gardens um, that help us to garden with nature and have that kind of um, kind of that kind of uh, how to describe it the scent component of an ecosystem I suppose um, and in Australia and let me know anywhere else on the world if uh, you have a favorite scented plant um, but some of the favorites that I have are native baronias, um, provide really, really great flowers and foliage that is um, great and, fra and fragrant. Uh, lemon myrtles is another one. Um, that's probably one of my favorite trees in Australia to grow in the garden. Um, and this doesn't have to be grown on, you know, the outside of the garden. It can be grown in the middle of a vegetable patch that you can prune it and, um, kind of work with it around whatever crop you have um, or even just at the end of a row of whatever you're growing um, and it's bound to increase the different bugs and pollinators that are going to be beneficial for your garden. Another one is native frangipanis. Um, another one is different leptospermums. So they are the tea tree in Australia and uh, if you've ever tried manuka honey, it's absolutely beautiful and um, yeah, it's, it's stunning if you ever get to the chance to taste it. Um, there's something there. Oh yeah, geraniums. Yeah, that's actually one on my list as well. Um, so Josh uh, said, loves the smell of lime geranium. Yeah, geraniums and different pelargoniums and citronella kind of style plants are absolutely beautiful to smell and they kind of ward off different mosquitoes that we, we might not want in the garden for ourselves. But they also bring in other pollinators that we do want as well, both from their flowers and their leaves. Um, another one is native mint bushes. And if you are interested in some of these other plants, there's a great YouTube channel um, that I recently found. I think his name is Jeff and his channel is called Whitbird Botanical. And he's an Australian YouTuber and he lives down, I think the South Coast, New South Wales, I think. And um, he has some great plant, uh, plant profiles on his channel. So definitely check out Whitbird Botanical. Um, and another one I had on here yeah, was Aniseed Myrtle as well. Honeysuckle Vines, oh, lovely. That would be beautiful <laughs> to have around in your area. Um, and another one uh, is, yeah, just other mints and uh, basil and different herbs as well. So incorporating herbs into the garden and different smelling plants is just one way that we can be working with nature. We're not actually doing too much different. We're just positioning them around our plants um, so that we do encourage pollinators to come. And that process and that function of having bugs in the garden that are beneficial is then is then done. And you don't have to, to worry about bringing that element in um, if you bring in these, these plants. So another um, point that I have here is to, when gardening with nature or for nature, one thing that I've been loving to do is finding a host plant for a different animal in your area. 
and this is where we can either be looking at a broad scale or a smaller scale as well. So we could be um, planting this, you know, in a little pot on your balcony, um, even, even really inside if you want to attract certain, I don't know, no one really wants to attract fruit flies, but you're still kind of creating a little bit of an ecosystem inside. Um, but more so outside, uh, we can, you know, encourage different animals to our garden and we can actually choose which ones we want. And we can do that by selecting different host plants. So in Southeast Queensland, there's a lot of vines. Uh, I think that I can't quite remember a lot of the names. I think there's a bird wing vine um, and there's a lot of different other smaller little dainty plants that attract butterflies. And some of these butterflies will seek out a certain one plant that they will either feed off, uh, off of the leaves or the nectar depending on their stage of development. Um, so you can be yeah, looking at things for small animals such as pollinators, or you can work your way right up to, if you want koalas around in Southeast Queensland, there's three different main trees and gums that they love to eat. And that's that, you know, you can eventually encourage koalas if you have a big enough area. Um, I know in our area here, we have quite a lot of koalas around and it is such a special moment when you get to see one in the wild, um, just sitting up on a tree. And usually there's certain species that you can find that they'll be sitting in more likely um, because they like to feed off certain leaves. Um, and at certain times of the year, they'll, they'll be more active and whatnot. Um, I don't want to touch that too much. I'm going to mess that up. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you can start to think about different host plants for uh, your garden. When I lived up in northern Queensland, there was some beautiful butterflies around and one of them was the Ulysses butterfly, which is a, it's basically the color of my shirt, only just more vibrant. It's a really bright blue butterfly that is pretty, pretty large. And they only, you know, they don't survive for a long time, um, but a lot of their habitat is um, being reduced because uh, they're more of a, a wet tropical kind of rainforest species. Um, but they like, they like certain plants. So I did some research and found uh, the pink euodia tree for um, the area that I was living in. And then I magically had Ulysses butterflies around in an area that I wouldn't have kind of expected them, um, but they started to come through. Um, so Barry says, thanks for the input regarding flowers. I follow a lady in the Northern Rivers area on Instagram and she mentions flowers all the time until this I had no idea of the importance yeah and and some of these flowers it's amazing that they can only last like even just a few weeks and that is crucial for whatever um, animal depends on that certain flower to come in at that certain time and um, take up as much nectar as they can lay their eggs because they'll usually lay their eggs on the leaves of whatever their, their kind of host plant is um, and then, uh, you know, the caterpillars will, will grow up on that plant. And it's really just like a home. And that, that's something that you can think about in your garden is how can you create a home for these animals that are going to benefit um, you and, you know, growing your food in the garden. And pollination is, is an ecosystem service. It's something that happens naturally that we benefit from, not just for honey, um, but for the majority of our food, well over 50% really requires pollination. Um, and in some areas where, going off on a tangent here, sorry. <laughs> um, in some areas where there's just no natural vegetation, there are no pollinators left. And that really scares me and has scared a lot of people in the world because um, when we don't think about the little things uh, and then they're lost, it's super hard to get them back. But if we can be providing kind of the apex uh, plant that these pollinators need, um, then yeah, we're, we're on the right track, I think. Uh, so if you can, um, even if you live in an apartment, rather than you know having all of your pots of veggies and, and fruits, which is super important, then just have one different flower or a different plant that you know, and it doesn't have to be native, it can be something that you know the bees like or um, 
you know that particularly if um, you're in an area that uh, has distinct seasons, we don't really have any seasons, seasons here in Southeast Queensland. It's either like warm or hot. <laughs> um, so we don't have to worry about pollinators hibernating really. But if you are in an area where you have snow and you don't have a lot of pollinators for a large part of the year, then you can you know, tactfully choose different species that might flower earlier or flower later to provide a little bit more food for a lot of pollinators. Um, no worries, that's okay. Um, Hardy Gardener, that's okay. No worries, you enjoy your dinner. I'll see you next time. <laughs> um, so yeah, finding a host, pellet, uh, finding a host plant is another um, yeah, thing we can do. Um, I'm gonna try not to say um, but I am sorry <laughs> if I say that a lot. So planting different colors and noticing colors around in nature is another thing that we can do to both garden with and for nature. When I go for my bushwalks, I am usually astounded by some of the different colors around in the area. And particularly around Brisbane, I've noticed a lot of yellow and purple flowers. And if you go onto um, a lot of native books and native, um, well, not native books, but native um, plant books for this area, and you go to the pink and the purple and the yellow flowers, there are so many in Southeast Queensland, so many different types of that color. Again, there's lots of other different colors as well, but I find that there's just a lot of those in bushland environments. And so having those colors in your garden is probably going to attract a lot of pollinators that are native to the area because they're already um, attracted to those different colors. So that's something that you can have a look at uh, in your own environment. I know in, and Josh will know this, in WA there are so many beautiful different colored flowers over there. The wildflowers in WA is probably the most stunning flower um, you know, display in, that I've ever seen and experienced. And there's, there's just so many different beautiful colors. A lot of them come out at different times, um, at kind of different stages. But you can also mimic that in your garden and try and choose different um, colors that come out at different times of the year to attract yeah, your native pollinators around. Um, so something that I have tried to do here, even with um, the different bush beans that I was planting, I planted a purple variety and there was a lot of purple flowering species around, a lot of native pea flowers. Um, and different hoviers and yeah I found that I had a lot of interest from a lot of bugs um, around from all of the purple flowers that I have. Um, different uh, times of the year are going to bring in different colours as well so um, just recently quite a few weeks ago or even kind of petering off now we had a lot of ivory curl flowers around in Brisbane that really gorgeous creamy yellow flowers that's another, um, another color that seems to be really popular around here. A lot of our eucalypts have beautiful creamy colors. Um, and yeah, so it's something that you can have a think about and really just search about in your, in your area as well. What colors are around and um, then what you might be able to plant as well. And finding colors and looking out at nature is a great way to then um, identify plants as well. So if you've got the flower, you've usually, it should be fairly simple to ID the plant as well. Yeah, Josh, I agree. There's some of the best wildflowers um, over in Western Australia. I miss it so much and I'm really hoping to maybe, yeah, come back hopefully this year if we can travel, um, if not next year and do some work over there and uh, be able to see the wildflowers again because, yeah, it's so beautiful. <laughs> um, so what are we up to with the time? So I'll probably go to about an hour or so. Um, uh, so the next, I'm saying um and R again, sorry. The next point uh, is to slowly change. Oh, awesome. Josh just linked us a video. So definitely have a look on that on wildflowers as well. I'll um, go through that afterwards and make sure to watch it um, if I haven't already. But... <laughs> Uh, the next point is to, if you want to garden with nature and something that you might want to think about is to slowly change the environment or your garden space that you're uh, working with. I completely understand that this, you know, can't be done some, some of the time if you are 
um, completely renovating a garden, you've got a time frame that's, you know, that you do whatever you have to do. But if you have, you know, I've got a really big garden here and I've been um, thinking about what I can grow and the time frame that I have and I really don't have a time frame for how long we'll be here or how long the garden will be here. But even when you're clearing things like weeds, uh, some pollinators will be depending, particularly if the weeds are flowering and kind of going to seed, some pollinators might depend on some of those weeds for food. So it's a really great idea to, although we really don't want weeds in the garden, um, we want to kind of replace them with things that will benefit us and, and nature as well. A great idea is just to slowly cut back the weeds. Uh, if you see a lot of pollinators around in that area, so if you see a lot of bee activity or butterflies, uh, they might be wanting those weeds for the flowers that they're producing. So you can slowly change that. Uh, and also when you are taking out a lot of your crops as well, it's great to leave uh, some you know, plants that are going to seed and, uh, and flower for some of the native pollinators around. I remember I, um, I had some lettuce that was going to seed. I had no idea how much, I had all these black little native bees around. I had no idea how much food that was going to provide the bees around by just letting it go to seed and I'm still eating the lettuce and sowing the seeds from that plant that I just let to let go to seed so there was just so many benefits from me doing that one extra step all of the other ones I took out of the ground but I just slowly kind of left that one in the ground to go to seed and not only did it benefit myself with getting seeds it was providing so much food around for all of the different plants and the animals. Uh, and, and it doesn't just stop with the bees, it continues on for all of those plant, all of those animals that then depend on the different honey and the, you know, eating the native bees. It just, it's a really flow on effect. So I like to, <laughs> I like to get a little dreamy when I think about this and it's probably my science brain going crazy. Um, but really just doing small changes like that is really going to have a flow on effect right through the food chain, right up to the top. So, you know, uh, any, anything that you can really do, no matter how small it is, it, it's always going to benefit um, your environment and, and then it'll impact yourself as well in the end. Uh, so another thing, and I think this is kind of the last on my list. So if you've got some questions right now, this is the time to write them in there about anything garden related, gardening with nature, um, life, like anything you want to know about myself, just yeah, let, let me know and I'll rattle off this last point and then go through some questions as well. The last point that I have here, and there's so many other points that we could talk about with gardening, uh, with nature and for nature, is it's so crucial to observe your environment. And that doesn't just mean going out and going for a bushwalk and you know driving hours and hours to be able to get to an area where you can go for a walk and um, be in nature. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It could mean sitting on your balcony and observing the birds around, observing what way the sun is coming in, what way the water flows in your, in your area. Uh, there's just so many different things that you can think about how your natural area around your little bubble works and then pull certain things from it. So it could be you see a certain butterfly, that's fantastic and then you can ID it and then maybe look to what plants it might like. You could even see a, you know, a pollinator that you're not too sure about and whether it could be native or not. It's something you could look into and if it's not native then you could think about okay well what's the impact that it has on the environment do i really want it around my plants and is there any plants then that i can plant in the area to um, kind of get it away or slowly move it along same with different birds are there any birds that might be depending on your area either for habitat or food um, and you know if it's impacting your house if it's creating a nest inside the roof which I have had many birds do that in the different houses I have lived at whether you can then create a habitat and a home for it uh, outside the roof of your house <laughs> um, 
there's so many things that you can do and the way I have been doing it and I spoke about it in my last live but this time I think I have actually linked the course but I've been doing some nature reading courses with Laura Bowen who provides some great resources for how you can reconnect with nature and we've been doing some different nature journaling at each day or every day that we, we can where I'll sit down and I'll record things like what way is the wind coming what way is you know where is the sun setting what's the temperature how do I feel from the temperature what animal encounters do I see? And over time, you can you know, build on that and create your own nature journal and you are bound to find some things about nature that uh, you might have not really realized without looking. And looking can sometimes be not even literally looking. It can be closing your eyes and having a quiet time and just taking in your surroundings and the different senses. So what you can smell, what you can hear, um, and just how you feel in nature as well, because it's so important to, I, I think it's important that we also garden for our mental health and nature is just one way, uh, the natural principles of nature is one way that we can tap into that and, you know, have some space, have some time to um, connect with, uh, with your God or any other kind of spiritual entity that you believe in being out in nature is a great way for you to have a clear mind and to think and to remember um, about, you know, your life and reflect on different things. Um, so, yeah, it's something just that I love to talk about on my channel. Of course, it's being called The Nature Patch. Um, but I really do think that the way nature works is so fascinating and we can bring it into our gardens bit by bit and you know trial and error and see what works um, some things might not work better than others but there's always something we can do so if you have any questions pop them in the chat now or let me know is there any way that you like to garden with nature at all um, i would love to know and to chat about that with the last kind of uh, what we have 13 minutes or so um, yeah, let me know because I know some people, I know Josh has a few different ideas on um, just the way he's really kind of planned out his garden from, you've done an amazing job from having, you know, nothing in that area to the garden that you've got right now. Um, yeah, being out in nature is really great for our mental health. Yep, that's an absolute fact. And it's actually something that uh, Diana goes into a lot in her book is um, the science behind it. So if you're into into science, I'd recommend to speak for the trees. Uh, it does get a little bit kind of wafty with science. And sometimes I, I'm not a big fan of people who use big words because it, uh, I don't even know what a lot of big words are. But <laughs> uh, she goes into concepts, even things like forest bathing is an actual thing. <laughs> bathing in the forest um, yeah so going for a walk in the forest she talks about the benefits that it has on our physical and mental health what it does to our brain um, the different uh, smells and actual like not hormones but kind of hormones that trees emit uh, into the air and different essential oils I suppose and what that does for our body and how it can actually open up different parts of our brains that we don't actually use in our day-to-day -day life. Um, another thing I remember her talking about in this book was um, going out with children and going, going with children to different areas of the forest and smaller humans and, and babies actually have different receptors to adults and can actually hear different uh, sounds and wavelengths that a forest produces because a forest and this book is amazing goes into that it talks about all of the different ways trees communicate with each other and you know to speak for the trees talking about um, how we're connected to trees and how trees are all connected to each other she goes into all this fascinating stuff about even that you know children and babies can hear certain things from the forest that uh, adults can't quite hear um, and yeah, different activities that go on in nature that um, yeah, different, different brains can pick up 
is super, super interesting to me at least. I don't know, I don't know about you all, but <laughs> it's something that I, I find super interesting and yeah, I'm really interested in it, I suppose, because for my job, one of the things that I, I have to think about is how I can create a bare piece of land from a mine site to an ecosystem. And that process is really quite challenging. And if you don't have a good grasp of nature and the different natural principles in nature, creating an ecosystem is super hard and uh, impossible unless you have all of those different components and can think about not only you know, what does the tree need, but what does the animals need? What does, um, what does the water need through the landscape and all of those different things. And something I was speaking about, speaking with Marty about, we were talking about permaculture. And while this chat, it, it's really directly related to permaculture, yes. Um, but permaculture kind of has more of the people side as well as nature, which is really, really important. Um, so with permaculture, you kind of have your three main principles, which is um, firstly your people care or firstly more earth care, which is the things that I've been talking about. Things like uh, people care and fair share is the three main components of permaculture. And it's, well, you know, the earth care is super important. We, we automatically start to think like, um, you know, what can we recycle? How can we reduce our carbon footprint and everything like that? And while that is so important and I could do, a, you know, hours and hours of talking about that, it, it is also important to take a step back and go, okay, let's just look at what's happening outside and see how we can apply that into our garden. Actually just, you know, roll with the punches and, uh, you know, do what's happening. So Barry says, our garden is in a community centre looked after by volunteers, most with physical or mental issues, but we're all keen to, um, sorry, but we are all keen, but very inexperienced at gardening. So we're keen to learn um, when explained well. Yeah, yeah. So honestly, I think anyone can have a garden and I have been around a lot of community gardens that are located um, kind of alongside different um, kind of counselling areas and um, yeah, mental health facilities. There is so much work and so many job opportunities, I think, in the next few years for gardeners and people with a garden um, interest or people who even are interested in growing their own food to bring this in and connect that with uh, like hospitals and areas where people are not thriving and bring a lot of this knowledge in. So yeah, I just find YouTube and talking about this just so fascinating and just I'm really hoping it can benefit a lot of people. Um, yeah, so, uh, so Tez user, human population buildings make green area in our planet. Yeah, getting smaller and smaller. That's really, really true. And uh, that could be a complete other different topic that I could rattle on about as well. Um, and maybe I'll try and um, find some studies that a lot of people do about the importance of green spaces. And all you need to do is you can type in and Google green space and the benefits of green spaces in cities. And yeah, it's absolutely amazing what a natural area can do for people's mental health. Um, and thankfully, uh, with a lot of planning regulations now, that's actually, you know, a necessity. I feel like in a lot of um, previ previous years, that kind of wasn't really seen as a necessity. But now towns and different suburbs, at least around me, are working around having a green space as the centre of a community. And, you know, that's kind of, you know, even a metaphor for gardening. I feel like it just brings people together having a having a green space around. And, you know, it doesn't just do that. It also, particularly in a city, uh, it can decrease the temperature for a certain area. Um, when you've got buildings and roads all around, there's kind of, it creates basically a heat bubble in, in a city. Breaking that up with trees and different green areas is just so important to um, lower the temperature and um, also provide habitat. Like who doesn't want to see a bird around? <laughs> um, unless, you know, it's, it's living in your roof. Like, 
some of the birds have done here, but you know, that's okay. They, they all have their homes. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, Sarah, we had a council footpath tree planting exercise in our area last week, but no fruit trees were planted. Yeah, that's something that I think hopefully will change really soon. And I think it just, yeah, it just takes people to do like, I don't know if I, um, I don't perfect, I don't quite live in an area where, um, there's a road reserve. It's kind of just in bushland, but I have. And unfortunately I was renting at the time, so it was quite hard, but I think a lot of people just need to start, you know, planting things on different road reserves just outside their houses. And it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to be like massive fruit trees either. It could just be a dwarf variety or something like that. And um, I think in Canberra, they had a really good program of planting trees and they were really encouraging um, different people to uh, plant fruit trees and plant um, herbs on the side of different areas um, but yeah there's I agree Josh there's so many opportunities for different councils to start growing them and honestly I think if we just keep if we keep making videos and keep talking about this and keep sharing the knowledge about uh, the importance of gardening then I think a lot of areas will probably cotton on and start to to change and do this I think it definitely is the way of the of the future to incorporate food into our gardens and like I, I love a good formal garden I love going and having a look at hedges and roses and things like that but it, it it's just a fact that that's actually just outdated now that's not how um what's not what a lot of people want in an area and a lot of people do uh, want some fruit trees and you know there are negative sides to having fruit trees around you are probably going to have a lot more animal activity um, in an area but that's just something you can think about in a more positive way um, that you are bringing animals into an area and there's that kind of bringing in the three elements of permaculture you know having something for the earth having something for people um, and yeah having something for like to share with everyone so yeah um all right so i've got a few more minutes left is there any last minute questions that i um yeah can answer at all let me know i think the rest of the week what's the rest of the week looking like for me i i'm writing a paper at the moment for my job my university research so i'm going to be really busy writing that I did put out a video today all about microgreens and um, you know that's something you can you can apply for this video apply to this video um, that you know it doesn't have to be too hard to start growing food and there is really no excuse um, to you know, not growing your own food unless you don't want to which is totally fine if you don't want to grow your own food <laughs> that that's cool um, but yeah it's it's an example of uh, you know something for beginner gardeners and experienced gardeners to start doing and to start growing um, and creating fresh produce and fresh food for you um, while maintaining kind of that ecosystem of having the you know the soil and the plants growing um, in either in your kitchen or outside as well fruit trees won't take out your house in a storm too that is so true <laughs> so true uh, the eucalypts around here almost did take our house out in a storm and um, it took a few days to to get all the power lines back together but um yeah the, I, I totally agree with that one have a nice day I'm watching from the Philippines oh that's so great that's so nice to see you um, all right so I think this week I am yeah, gonna focus on getting a few more flowers in the ground um, maybe I'll do some more research and report back <laughs> at some point on um, some host plants for some butterflies I do have quite a few books for the area around here that I have gotten for Christmas and birthdays about lots of different plants that grow so I'm going to be looking into some host plants so that's maybe something you can have a look at as well um, and I'm also going to probably be, um, I, okay, so I'm going to be sorting through my seed stash very soon and picking out a lot of my autumn and winter plants that I'm going to be growing. 
I just checked before the soil down in the area that I created in the in-ground garden. And even after a month of kind of creating, uh, turning that from grass to what it is now and building up that soil with organic matter, oh my goodness, it is, it is looking amazing. So I'm really excited to plant uh, some, some veggies and some winter produce in that area. So Homestead Aquarius, I'm so happy at the message you're sending out. I do the same thing. Nature will help us if we only try to understand and try to help her. Exactly. Yeah, we can definitely be benefiting from everything that nature has to give. All we have to do is really just let that happen and um, yeah, make that accessible. And um, oops. and yeah, I'm sure I'm sure that'll happen. So, um, Nature Patch, did you join in Shed Wars? I didn't this year, and the reason for that is because I said to myself that I couldn't commit to anything else because I had just had so much going on with work um, and trying to yeah create videos just um, more than kind of one a week was just not feasible. But I'm loving watching all of the Shed Wars, and it was also at the start of when I had um, started my garden, so I was really focusing all of my time on starting the garden. Um, but I'm interested to see how that all pans out with the shed wars. Um, you know, I have I have my favorites, but I'll, I'll keep that for another time. <laughs> um, it's great to see everyone participating in that, super fun. All right, so I think I might uh, wrap the live up now. It's been, yeah, really awesome chatting um, to you all and sharing some of this knowledge. And if anyone is re-watching this uh let me know if if you've made it this this far please please let me know <laughs> because i would love to um yeah know if people listen to this or not and uh make sure to give the video and the live a like to help push this into that that magical little world of youtube algorithms and um yeah i will definitely be back on the last sunday of next month I'm going to do them the last Sunday of every month and um, have a chat as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for everyone who else is here and no worries. Thank you so much, Barry and Josh and Homestead Aquarius for joining in. And um, yeah, I really hope you all have a lovely Sunday afternoon slash Saturday night slash wherever you are in the world. And um, yeah, until my next video, happy gardening, everyone. Bye.